These are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Terry Erzman. I'm the VP of Marketing for Citus Data. Uh, today we're uh, pleased to uh, present Scale Out Postgres and Visualize Your Big Data with AJ Welsh from Chartio and Marco Sloan from uh, Citus Data. Uh, before we start, if I could please have a show of hands. If you can hear me, please uh, raise your hand. Okay, I see lots of hands raised. Thanks, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions during day, today's presentation, please enter them in the questions panel of your GoToWebinar uh, control panel, and uh, we'll answer as many of those as we can at the end of the webinar. We are recording today's webinar, and a link to the uh, webinar recording and the slides will be sent to you uh, within the next day. So with that, uh, we'll start off with uh, about a 20-minute presentation by Marco, then we'll turn it over to AJ for a presentation and demonstration, and then get to the questions. Marco? All right. Thanks, Terry. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Marco. I'm a software engineer at, at Citus Data, and I want to give you a brief sort of technical introduction into Citus DB and how it can help you uh, with building actually analytical dashboards with tools like Chart.io. So the trouble with analytical dashboards from the perspective of a database builder is that you want very fast response times, um, as in like if a user clicks on a graph or changes some, some filtering, you don't want to have the user to have to wait 20 seconds. So you want that to be at most a few hundred milliseconds. But then the queries that these dashboards tend to make, like the SQL queries, they process a very large amount of data. Like go count uh, the number of events in the last 30 days or some number of bytes in the last 30 days. It's always uh, quite a lot of data. And then the data size tends to grow over time, but also the ingestion rate and the query load tend to grow, you know, if your product is, is being is successful. And uh, there's also many different views that a dashboard tends to take, like changes in filters, changes in groupings. Um, and, well, why that's important is that we do not really cache the data. Like, you show a graph for the last hour or so, then there's no way to cache that because 10 minutes from now will already be different, um, as an example. And potentially, your uh, dashboard has many concurrent users, um, which puts a lot of load on the database. And so you need a database that can, can scale out to accommodate increasingly large data and ingestion rates, uh, but also parallelize queries to actually give you these fast response times, despite the fact that you need to process a large amount of data every time. A lot of companies uh, like to use Postgres as their database because it's quite reliable, stable, it offers you a sort of standards compliant SQL, uh, it actually supports much more of the SQL standards than, for example, MySQL does. Uh, it, of course, it provides general purpose asset transactions. It has other nice features not listed here, like uh, the index support in Postgres is probably the most comprehensive of any SQL database. So a lot of companies like it. And actually, one of the nicest features of, of Postgres is the fact that you can extend it with um, new features. So. Uh, we, for example, we have a C-Store FDW extension which allows you to create columnar tables in your Postgres database. So you can have a database with both row-based and columnar tables. Uh, you can actually even have tables that are both columnar and row-based. And you can even completely change the behavior of the database. You can overwrite the whole query planning and execution pipeline in an extension. So that's very, is very powerful. Uh, another great thing about Postgres is the way it does concurrent queries using uh, MVCC, so that's multi-version concurrency control, which allows uh, selects and inserts and updates to all run concurrently, and Postgres is very efficient at, at doing that. But then, of course, the limitations of Postgres is, are that it only runs on a single server. I um, mean, you can set up a replica, but basically it's a single server software. And it only uses one process or one thread per query, meaning you can only use a single core uh, to answer a SQL query. And for the analytics use case, that's not great because we have to process a very large amount of data in a short time. So CytusDB actually extends Postgres 9.4 to uh, relieve those limitations. 
and it adds the notion, basically a CITUSDB node is just like a Postgres node, but it adds the notion of a distributed table. And uh, a distributed table is a table that's not actually stored on uh, the server itself, but rather it's distributed or sharded across a cluster of worker nodes. And when you query uh, the distributed table, then the query will actually par be parallelized across those worker nodes. So we'll look at some examples of that. Um, the way the data is stored, this can be it can be partitioned in different ways by CitusDB. You could use range partitioning, which is very good if you're bulk loading a lot of uh, time series data, like you keep getting new log files, for example, and hash partitioning, which is better for kind of key value oriented, document oriented workloads. Uh, CitusDB can also do distributed joins, and there's functions for automatic uh, data rebalancing, for example, when you add a worker node. And um, again, one of the great things about Postgres is its extensibility. So you can actually use CitusDB with, for example, CStore, when where you get columnar storage in, in Postgres, uh, which is works very well for certain types of analytical queries. Uh, there's also PG Shard, which in a way it's just the insert and update and delete feature in CitusDB, but we've bundled that as a as a freely available open source extension as well. Uh, but you can also use other extensions like hyperlog log, which does uh, distinct count approximations. So if you look at a uh, CitusDB cluster, there's going to be a master node and there's going to be a bunch of worker nodes. Now if you log into the master node, um, there might be a distributed table, but this just looks like an ordinary table. Um, you will actually not notice the difference, but if you query it, then CitusDB will actually intercept that query and then execute it in a distributed way. So we'll look at, at some examples of, of how that works. If you look at the worker nodes, uh, those are, uh, you'll see a bunch of tables which are named like underscore, uh, sorry, distributed table name underscore shard ID. And these are the what we call the shards. And this is where the actual data is stored. So this, the data is stored in regular Postgres tables. And you can query these tables as normal. You can put triggers on them or indexes. Uh, like the regular tables, and you typically have uh, many of them per worker node, but you'll also see the same uh, shards, the same table names across multiple worker nodes because CitusDB does replication. And uh, the reason for that is, you know, if you have a cluster of any number of nodes, the likelihood um, of one of those nodes being down at any given time can be quite can become quite high if you have a very large cluster. So CitusDB does its own replication and that allows it to um, recover from failure even during a query. So we, if a worker node fails while a query is running, CitusDB can sort of instantly recover from this. So what actually happens when you query the distributed table? Well, so the master node, uh, which has this distributed table, knows about the shards, it knows where they're all placed. And uh, it will actually translate incoming queries into a bunch of queries on each shard. And it will send out those queries in parallel by just opening uh, multiple connections. And even on the worker, uh, it'll open multiple sessions on the same worker such that uh, the, the worker does multiple queries in parallel. And it, it will gather the results for those queries, which are usually small, in a uh, sort of temporary table and then run a final query which merges the result. So more concretely, um, if we look at, for example, the user runs select average latency from events. Now average is a bit tricky. Actually, a sum would have been easier. Like if to calculate the overall sum, you can take the sum of each chart and then uh, collect those sums in, in temporary table and take the sum of the sums. But for average, that doesn't quite work. We cannot just take the average of the averages. So in that case, the query actually gets translated into queries like these, where it select the sum of the latency, the count of the latency from uh, the shard. So I've kind of abbreviated the shard names here just for uh, visibility. And so all these queries go out in parallel, like this, and uh, which, which usually, I mean, it, it kind of depends on which shard has the most um, relevant items that could be, that that could bound your query time. But typically, this uh, 
this query can be performed very quickly. And then um, all the, the, sum of the, the sums of the latencies and the counts of the latencies are gathered in a temporary uh, table. Here I called it results. And then there's a final merge query. So in this case, we sum the sums and divide it by the sum of the counts to get the overall average. And this is returned to the user as the result of the distributed query. So we've kind of pretended uh, as though there was, uh, as the query, as though the query was executed on the master, but then the actual work was being pushed down to the to the workers. Now, um, apart from querying the data in parallel, we also want typically want to be able to add new data at uh, a pretty high rate. So. If you have range partitioned your table, and particularly if you're, uh, you have kind of time series data and you've partitioned it by time, a very fast way uh, that Citus to be provides is uh, what we call the stage command, which actually just copies the data directly into the workers into a new shard or into an existing shard. And um, because it uses the Postgres copy commands, like this is much faster than, let's say, doing inserts, the copy command can do millions of rows per second. And um, this data goes can go directly into the workers, so it doesn't have to go through the master. So you can there's no bottleneck here. You can ingest uh, at arbitrarily high rates just depending on how many workers you have. Um, the only thing is that at the end of this stage command, the, uh, the master or the metadata on the master gets updated to tell it that there's a new shard and it becomes visible to all uh, future queries. And so on the, if we look at the master, the master keeps some metadata on all these shards. Um, and in this case, it's actually kind of kept automatically. So if we add a new shard, the master will actually inspect that shard, look at what is like the minimum value in my partition column and the maximum value and add that to the metadata. Um, so an important concept here is, is the notion of a, a partition column. Each, each distributed table is partitioned by a certain column. But you can also partition by composite types, for example. Um, and so range partitioning is great if you're ingesting time series data in bulk. But um, if you actually want to do inserts, it's not that great because actually if there's there might not be a range within which your inserts uh, falls. So in that case, actually, you decided to be errors out to say, you know, you need to create a range first. Now, an easier way of dealing with inserts and updates and deletes is actually to use hash partitioning. So in that case, um, it, it, we basically just do inserts on the distributed table on the master node. And um, CitusDB will look at, well, what's the value in the partition column? It will calculate a hash of that value using Postgres built-in hash functions. And based on that hash value, the insert goes to a particular shard. Um, and so the metadata in that case actually says, well, this shard contains this particular range of hash values. And when you use hash partitioning, you create um, like all the shards at the start, basically. Maybe you create 100 shards, and then uh, the integer the, the complete range of integers will be chopped into 100 pieces, and then uh, every partition column value will have a particular shard that it goes to. And this doesn't just work for inserts, it also works for selects, like when CitusDB gets a select, it will look at the where clause uh, and say, if it says user ID is six, then uh, it will know, okay, this actually has to go to this particular shard. So it sends it directly, which is which is quite fast. And so this is what works really well if you have kind of a document-oriented workload or a key value workload. Uh, but the nice thing is you can combine that more operational workload with uh, the analytical uh, capabilities of CitusDB. You can still query your, your data in parallel. So another feature of, uh, of CitusDB is the ability to do joins. Now, when you do joins, um, usually when, when customers come to us and say, we want to do joins, the first thing we say is, well, do you really need to do joins? Um, because on, on a cluster, it, a join is a bit of a, a trickier type of query because you need to uh, combine these two different uh, data sources which might not be placed on the same machine. 
But uh, so if you do want to do joins, next question is, can we actually co-locate uh, and co-partition these two distributed tables? So let's say we have, uh, well, two distributed tables here, E and D. Now, if they're both partitioned, let's say, by user ID, and the user and we're actually join want to join them on the user ID column, and E1 contains uh, the same set of user IDs as D1, then what CITESDB can do is just send down uh, a join query for each of the pairs of the shards. Um, the way it's kind of visualized here, it's as if it also um, joins the replicas, which obviously it wouldn't do unless there's a failure. But um, so it can send out those join queries and then just merge the results. And this is quite fast because Postgres has a very fast uh, join machinery. Um, usually when we compare CITES to be to other systems like Impala or Spark, uh, we especially win on the joins just because the Postgres join machinery is, is really quite fast. Um, now, the other case is when you're joining on something that is not the partition column or you're joining two tables that are not co-located, then in that case what CITESDB will have to do is to basically reshuffle or repartition as we call it, um, either one table to match the other or both tables. So in that case it will send out uh, special commands that we added that will uh, take a shard and then uh, for each row decide well, this, uh, you know, the user ID is 5, so this goes into this bucket. User ID is 10, so it goes into that bucket. And then it'll, spread, it'll merge those buckets back into kind of a temporary distributed table. So this, uh, you know, sounds like a lot more work. It is a lot more work. And especially the copying data over the network part is where this get, kind of gets expensive. So very often for a dashboard, uh, you want to avoid this because it, it can take, uh, depending on the data size, um, several seconds or for a very large data set, maybe even minutes. But CITESDB is kind of smart about how it does these joins. It will only try to repartition the smallest amount of data. So also if there is a filter on the query, uh, like you know, Z is 20, whatever that means, uh, it will first run the filter, first apply the filter, and only then repartition what is left after the filter. Um, so it which might actually be very little. So sometimes actually these, these joins are still quite fast. Okay, so how does, uh, we, we actually get the question a lot of how does CITESDB compare to data warehouses like Redshift and Greenplum? And um, I think the, the main difference is CITESDB is a bit more optimized for the dashboard use case. So it's, it typically provides much lower response time for common dashboard queries like you know, select date, come account from events, uh, where user ID equals five, group by date. It's a very typical uh, query that a dashboard might generate, and CITESDB is very fast for these types of queries. Um, also, the real-time data ingestion performance, uh, CITESDB can do very fast, reasonably high throughput, uh, inserts and updates and deletes, um, but also do the bulk loading very fast. Uh, and especially also because it lets you choose between row-based and columnar storage, like the default is row-based, which in terms of ingestion is actually a bit faster than columnar stores like Redshift because it, it doesn't force you to uh, split the data into columns, basically. Uh, it tends to have better concurrency. There's no limit to the number of users. This is actually a huge difference between uh, CITESDB and data warehouses. So it's quite good because it uses the Postgres MVCC um, to actually run queries concurrently, it's quite good at doing a lot of queries uh, in parallel and, uh, you know, having a lot of users run queries in parallel. And I think most importantly, it's based on mo modern Postgres, uh, whereas Redshift and Greenplum kind of forked from a very old version of Postgres, like 8.0. Um, like, CITESDB is always compatible or based on, on the, uh, the latest version of Postgres. And so 9.4, for example, added the JSOND data type, which is kind of a binary JSON data structure that you can use in your tables. Uh, 9.1 added foreign tables, which is what we use for CStore, but you could even, you know, set up a CITESDB cluster that queries data outside of the database. 
Um, 9.3 add a lot of performance improvements, and most of all, you, you get access to the entire ecosystem of Postgres extensions like PostGIS or, um, well, I mentioned Hyperlog Log, which is especially useful if you have a lot of uh, distinct count queries, like the number of distinct IP addresses that visited your website in the last 30 days. There's special Postgres extensions for that. Uh, and also, you can run it on premises or in the cloud or even on your desktop. You could even uh, use it to parallelize queries locally. Uh, so there's, it buys you a lot more, more flexibility. Um, now, of course, the cons, uh, it's not a data warehouse, and it's not very suitable for very complex queries. And uh, for example, it doesn't support uh, subqueries in the where clause, uh, which is kind of a natural, like if you have a environment where people are writing a lot of ad hoc business intelligence, queries, uh, people actually like using subqueries in the where clause, uh, even though it might be faster to write it as a join. But like if you're in that kind of environment where you cannot control uh, your queries, uh, like CitusDB is, is not as good a choice. And uh, for the queries like the repartition joins, the data warehouses are a bit more optimized for those types of uh, queries, where which are okay if they take you know a few seconds or a few minutes. Um, where, where CitusDB is actually more optimized for the simple low response time queries. Okay, with that, I'd like to pass it over to AJ, uh, who's going to show us how to combine CitusDB with uh, Chart.io. AJ. Great, thank you, Marco. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. I can see. Awesome. Okay, so my name is AJ. Uh, I'm a data engineer at Chartio, uh, and today we're going to talk about Chartio and Citus TB. Uh, so first, a little bit about Chartio. Uh, I'm going to walk you through here, sort of the story of Chartio uh, and what the vision is for this tool, uh, and then at the end, we're going to demo an actual dashboard connected to CitusDB visualizing uh, GitHub data. So Chartio is a business intelligence tool and it's built for every device and every user. And the real goal with Chartio is to empower anyone in a business to visualize and analyze real-time enterprise data. So this is not just your data analyst team, but we also want to empower your business users. So many companies that you know use Chartio today. Uh, we have a long list of customers, over 300 customers now. Um, so these are some of the companies that we work with that are empowering uh, their whole team to make data-driven decisions. And we actually have some extended case studies if you want uh, an, an in-depth overview of how these companies use Chartio. So you can go to chartio.com slash customers. Uh, the link is in the bottom left-hand corner there. So Chartio is really for modern business users. Um, so let's unpack for a second exactly what a modern business user has to do in their day-to-day -day role. Uh, so there's all different departments. You have marketing, sales, uh, product. It's not just engineering and data teams. Um, and the usage patterns are very different than what we used to see with legacy BI systems. Uh, so people are looking at dashboards a lot more frequently. People want information uh, almost in real time nowadays. Uh, mobile access. So it's not people sitting at uh, desks you know, anymore. It's people on the run at meetings uh, out on the road. Uh, there's also the occasional exploration and creation. So historically, usually you needed a, a BI analyst or an engineer to create the actual charts for you. Uh, and a lot of business users nowadays want to be able to create the charts themselves. Um, and the main reason they need to do all this is because they need answers for their jobs and they need the answers now. Um, so the current options are really to rely on a data person, rely on Excel, um, you know, there, there have been ways for business users to do their own analysis, and Excel it tends to be the most popular tool amongst business users. Um, but then you really get data isolated into a desktop environment, uh, and you can't really share and collaborate. So what we call that old school model is centralized BI. Uh, so you have a bunch of different data sources, and you centralize them into one data warehouse, and you have a centralized data team that manages that data warehouse and creates all the charts and dashboards for the business users. Uh, and this creates a bottleneck. Um, there's stale data, it's ex uh, expensive to set up, expensive to maintain, uh, 
Uh, and it really separates the business users from their data. They have to make a request, they have to wait for the dashboard to be created, and then by the time they get it, um, they may have a whole other question, and it doesn't, really, it doesn't really promote interactive analysis. So what Chartio has done is created what we call distributed BI. Um, so this is many data sources connected to the BI tool, and it's many users connected to the BI tool. Uh, and this frees the data team up to do what they were hired to do, the more advanced analyses, the statistical analysis, or what we call today data science. Uh, so this is just a zoom in here on the distributed BI model. Uh, so Chartio works very well with the centralized model as well. If you want to set up a, a centralized data warehouse and if you want to have a centralized uh, data team, by all means, go ahead. Uh, but Chartio can actually reach out to different data sources in your organization and combine them on the fly. Um, we can also create team-specific schemas, so your finance team doesn't have to be looking at the same schema as your sales team or as your engineering team or your marketing team. Uh, you can customize how the database looks based on the end user's role. Um, and this, this creates a much more distributed model where more people in the company are getting access to data and more people in the company are actually uh, making their own data-driven decisions. Um, so we're going to jump into a demo now and actually show you how this all works with um, Citus data. Uh, I just want to check one more time. Can you guys still see my screen? Yep. Awesome. So this is the home page uh, in Chartio. This is where you get dropped when you first sign in. Um, and just to give you a quick view here of what a dashboard looks like in Chartio, this is what we call sort of a company KPI dashboard. This is a fake organization that we created called DigiSign, it's basically a, a fake e-signature application. Um, and they're visualizing all the data that they have in their Salesforce instance and in their uh, in the back end of their web application. Um, so there's a broad uh, variety of charts that you can create and different visualizations. Uh, and all these charts and visualizations can be pulling from multiple different databases. So let's take a look at a dashboard I built to visualize GitHub data uh, using Citus DB. So I set up a Citus cluster. Um, it's a three-node cluster. They provided a cloud formation template, which made it really easy to set up. So there's a master node, and I have two worker nodes. Uh, we loaded in uh, GitHub event data for a few hours of uh, January 1st, 2015. So uh, the first thing you can notice here on the dashboard is that it's interactive. So we have a whole set of uh, filters that you can create. Right here I've created a drop-down filter so I can narrow in on specific um, event types. So I should explain this is coming from the GitHub event API uh, and it's the public event API so whenever an event takes place on GitHub for a public repo uh, they log it and they provide that data publicly. So here are the different uh, event types. Uh, here are the counts by hour and here is the percentage breakdown uh, of those counts by hour. Uh, and so I can zone in here on uh, specific event types. So I can take a look at issues. I can compare those to push events. Uh, and I can start to drill down into the data. Uh, if we take a look at how these charts are built, this is what we call the chart creator. Um, so there's three parts to the chart creator. There's the drag and drop interface. There's the visualization component. And then there's the data pipeline. Uh, so the drag and drop interface is going to generate the SQL for you and this is really how business users are able to get in and create their own charts and manipulate the data themselves without relying on a data team or without relying on learning SQL. Um, the drag and drop creates really straightforward SQL. It basically extracts the data and aggregates it for you. This is the sort of uh, simple queries that Marco was talking about earlier that you want really fast response times on. The data pipeline allows you to do the more complex uh, analysis, the more complex data manipulation uh, that may be tough to do, that may be tough to parallelize uh, on, on Citus. So this query here is, um, <clears throat> hold on one second. Yeah, so this query here is event type by hour. Uh, and you can see we've hooked it up to the dropdown on the dashboard. Uh, so it's listening to that dropdown, and it will respond to that dropdown whenever you change the event type. So an example here of what I've done in the, in the data pipeline that would have been more difficult to do in the database in SQL is I've pivoted the data. So we can take a look at what this data looked like when it came out of the database. 
So we have all the hours here, and then we have the event types. Um, but this isn't, a, this isn't a great format to actually visualize it. In order to create this nice bar chart that we have, we want to get it pivoted so that the event types are across the top of the table. Uh, and usually if you wanted to do this in SQL, it would have been a very complex query where you basically would have had to, you, you probably would have had to write case statements for each one of these. So for each one of these event types, you would have a column, you would write a case statement, you would need to know the distinct number of event types that you wanted to pivot beforehand. Um, Postgres actually has extensions that help you do this. I think there's a table funk extension that helps you do this, but it can be very difficult uh, and, it, and it probably isn't parallelizable or may not be. Um, so we've done it here in the pivot data step and we can see what the data looks like when we get it out on the other uh, end here. We've got all the event types across the top and now we can neatly visualize them uh, in this horizontal bar chart. So there's a whole bunch of different visualizations we could have chose. Chartio tries to be smart about the format of the data and let you know which chart types will work with uh, the data that you've returned, uh, and it'll gray out any chart types that don't work with this data. And each chart type comes with its own settings. So there's a whole bunch of settings in here. If I had a table chart, there would be a different, uh, there would be different options in here. And this is how you customize the look and feel of each chart. So one way uh, to interact with the data is through what we call uh, dashboard filters. So we looked at one here. Another way is through what we call drill down. So if I want to use one chart to control another chart, um, we would use our drill down feature. And this is the type of interactive dashboard analysis that Marco was speaking about that you really want to be snappy. Uh, this is stuff that you really want to get as much parallel performance out of as possible uh, because this is the, the type of analysis that your business users are going to be uh, you know, doing a lot. And this is the type of activity that will really hammer the database. So you see here, I can just click here and every time I click, so if I take a look at like the Rust language, uh, their GitHub repo, events by hour, and now I can take a look at you know this one. Each one of these is generating a new SQL query and it's changing the where clause and it's sending that off to your database. So the faster you can make this, uh, the better because it will be more interactive for your end users. Uh, we can also take a look at the raw data here. Uh, so you don't have to, uh, you don't have to just use the drag and drop. If I take a look at how this chart was built, we give you SQL mode too. So if you want to write SQL and you want to write advanced SQL uh, and you want to use extensions that are available in your database that our interactive mode doesn't know about, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. And we give you a nice data table for you to uh, search through the search through the raw data. So this is searching through this payload field here. <clears throat> I want to take a look at the back end of Chartio real quick uh, and show you what the schema looks like for this database and some of the customizations that we've made to it. So I connected CitusDB as a regular uh, Postgres database, which is great. Uh, it just works out of the box with our generic Postgres uh, connector. And when you connect Chartio to a database, it's going to go in and based on the user you give it, it's going to reflect all the tables and columns that are available to uh, that user. Uh, so here I've created two different tables. I created uh, basically the same table twice, but I use a different distribution method. So uh, I use the append distribution method uh, in one case, and I use the hash distribution uh, method in another case. Uh, the third thing I did here is I created a repo event count. So this is an aggregated table where I basically just aggregated the number of events by uh, repository uh, for the data that we have loaded. Um, <clears throat> so this gives me uh, basically like a distinct list of repos and I added a foreign key here from the GitHub events table to that repo table. So this will allow us to perform joins uh, in Chartio and this will actually tell our drag and drop how to structure the joins in SQL and it will push the join down to the database uh, which is great for us because uh, Citus is going to perform this join in parallel for us. Uh, you, we can also perform joins on Chartio servers, and I'll show you how to do it both ways. Um, but every, the point here is everything that we reflect from the database is customizable. So you can customize the foreign keys, you can customize the data types if you need to, um, you can rename columns, you can hide columns uh, so that your end users can't query them. The view that you give your end users is completely customizable, and this is what I was talking about earlier uh, when we speak of team-specific schemas. Uh, if this table wasn't pertinent to my sales team, 
and I was making a sales specific schema, I could just hide this entire table. The other thing to notice, if I, the other thing to notice here is I've added a repo name uh, column. So the name of the repository is actually inside a uh, JSON field, uh, which isn't really uh, a great thing for my end users to be querying. They may not even be familiar with JSON. So what I've done is I've created a calculated column here in the back end by clicking Add Custom Column. And I've pulled that repository name uh, out of the JSON object. Uh, and now it will just look like a regular column to my end users. So if we go back to the dashboard, we can see an example of that here. This is being pulled out of uh, JSON. And it you know, looks a little more friendlier to the end user instead of this. Uh, and we can take a look at the join that I set up with the foreign key. So I've set up two different versions of joins here. This is what we call a single layer join. Based on that foreign key that I set up on the back end, the drag and drop is going to figure out the join for us. So if we take a look at SQL mode, it's generated this join here. And it's done it from the repo event count table, which is our distinct li list of repos. And it's joined that to the events table. And it's joined it on uh, repo ID. Uh, and that's great. So this is going to get sent off to Citus. And Citus is going to parallelize, parallelize that join for us. Uh, and give us our results set. Uh, if we wanted to join to data that we didn't have in Citus for whatever reason, maybe you have data in Google Analytics or some other data source, we could do what we call a multi-layer join. So I've just basically done the same example that we looked at before, but in this case, I use layers. So in layer one here, I'm pulling the repo ID, the event ID, and event type from the GitHub events table. And <clears throat> In layer two, which is a brand new layer, uh, it's sort of, sort of similar to Photoshop where if you add a new layer, you get a blank canvas. Uh, this gives you a blank query editor to build a brand new query. Uh, so in layer two, I've added the repo ID and the count, and I've pulled that from the repo event count table. So this layer is pulling from the event count table. This layer is pulling from the events append table. And in the data pipeline, I'm specifying how I want these to be joined. So you have all your different join types here, and you can do a compound join on more than one column. And Chartio is issuing two separate queries to Citus, uh, and it's pulling that data back onto Chartio servers, and it's performing the join there. So we're not getting the parallelization here, which is you know, probably what we want. This isn't the way we would normally do this join. Uh, but the benefit of doing it this way is uh, we could add a new layer, and we could pull from a completely different data source. So I could point this layer at Google Analytics, and this will issue a query to Google Analytics, and it will join that up with our Citus DB data based on how we specify the join in the data pipeline. Uh, and without any ETL or any data warehousing, we've now combined uh, you know, parallelized queries from Citus and uh, data from the uh, Google Analytics API. The last thing I want to show you here is the metadata. So not only do we get access to um, the tables that you have placed into Citus DB, but you can also access the metadata. Um, so there's some good docs in Citus, uh, Citus's uh, reference manual about the different metadata tables that are available to you. So PG disk partition, this is showing how our three different tables that we created are partitioned. So we have GitHub events, uh, events append, and the repo event. You can see the events hash and the repo event table are uh, hash distributed, and the append table uh, is append distributed. We have the PG disk shard table. So this is showing how all these different tables are sharded. Uh, so here's the GitHub events append table, uh, the shard min and uh, max values, and the shard ID. Uh, and if we want to see where these shards are on the cluster, we can look at the shard placement table. Uh, so we have the same information from the PG disk shard table, but we also have uh, the node name. Uh, so a lot of people you know, first start using Chartio for their business intelligence needs. Uh, and rolling it out to their business users, but then they also find at the end of the day that they can use it to inspect their own infrastructure. Uh, and you can, if you do set up a data warehouse or something like that, uh, you can get insight into that warehouse, how it's performing. Uh, you can get information about which queries are running the longest, and you can start to optimize your dashboards uh, from there. <clears throat> um, so that's about all that I wanted to show. We did this based off of the, uh, uh, basically there's, you know, Citus provides um, a publicly available GitHub uh, data set uh, and a CloudFormation template to get up and running. Uh, so 
this this is all clonable. We can clone these dashboards uh, if you do opt to sign up for a free trial of Chartio, and you can start to play around uh, with this data and with these dashboards yourself. Um, so with that, I'd like to finish up here by just saying Chartio has a free trial. Um, if you'd like to get started visualizing your data on top of Citus, feel free to reach out. Um, you can either go to our website or uh, call our sales team, and they'll get you started right away. Thank you. Okay, thank you, AJ. Uh, once again, if you have questions, please enter them in the uh, questions panel in the go to uh, webinar interface, and we'll answer as many of those as we have time to uh, to answer. Uh, Marco, uh, first question is for you: Is support for CTEs and left join on the roadmap? Um, yes, definitely. Support for left join is on. Um, uh, the near-term roadmap CTEs, uh, not directly. Like we, depending on what you want to do, uh, very often, like you can get a lot of missing SQL functionality by doing a sort of create table as statement, where you temporarily uh, copy your results into a, a table. Actually, you should probably use create temporary table as, and then uh, you can perform. A, additional processing on that local table, assuming it's it's kind of uh, a small result set. So you can do first like a parallel query that filters out most of the results and then you can do post-processing with CTEs or any SQL features on, on the temporary table. Uh, I think for distributed queries, I don't think that CTEs will be on our, our near-term roadmap. Okay, uh, AJ, a uh, question for you. What what, uh, what are the uh, major uh, database types that Chartio supports? Yeah, so Chartio supports just about um, any relational database uh, that you can think of. Is my screen still uh, showing? I can it actually... is, yes. So I can show you here real quick. When you sign up for Chartio, uh, if you've never connected a data source before, you're going to first come to the data sources page and add a new data source. And there's a whole long list here of data sources that we support, um, including uh, you know hosted services like Heroku or Amazon RDS. Um, we also have started branching out into services. So like I mentioned in the webinar, you can connect to Google Analytics, uh, but we can also connect you to Salesforce, Segment, Twilio, and this will report directly against the APIs. Um, <clears throat> Probably one last thing to note here is we can get at Hadoop as well uh, through Presto. So if you can work with Presto, uh, you can connect Chartio directly to Presto and start uh, working with your Hadoop data too. Okay, very good. Um, I think that's the, uh, the end of the questions for right now. Um, if anyone has any further questions, please put them in the uh, questions window. Uh, Marco, is there anything else you'd like to, uh, to add to, uh, to the webinar? Um, yeah, so, well, I, th I think it's important for, uh, like, for Citus to be, to point out, like, uh, it's, it's actually a very suitable database for, uh, this type of analytical dashboard, and, um, particularly, like, we have a lot of customers that use it for that purpose, um, uh, like, a, a, a well-known example is Cloudflare, uh, they're a very large, one of the largest content delivery networks, and if you um, if you use Cloudflare as a as a website provider, they provide you with a dashboard where you can see like what your traffic for the last 30 days and, and other other graphs for your uh, related to your account. And all that um, you know all those all the data for that graph for those graphs is being generated by CitusDB. And so Cloudflare has a blog post. Uh, so if you Google for Cloudflare uh, CitusDB. Uh, they'll actually they actually share their architecture, uh, which uses Kafka to actually get, uh, kind of as a pipeline for the log uh, data that they generate into CitusDB, uh, which is and, and a lot of we see a lot of new CitusDB users now using that as an example or as a like basically good starting point for 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 using CitusDB. Um, Do you have any new questions? Yeah, um, AJ, is there anything else you'd like to add to the uh, to the webinar? Yeah, so I think that's a great point by Marco. Um, 
so we do work with a bunch of different databases, uh, and we do work with other, you know, MPP style data warehousing databases. Uh, and the, although they can be great for analytics, uh, we definitely see uh, issues with concurrency, especially. So Chartio gets a lot of penetration within the companies that sign up. Uh, we aim to get 80 to 90 percent of the company on the tool if we can, and that can result in a lot of users. You know, we have companies that have a thousand seats on Chartio, um, and once you have that many people looking at dashboards, especially the interactive dashboards with the drop downs and the drill down features, it can start to really pile up uh, and send a lot of queries to the database. Uh, so I've been pretty impressed with Citus. I've been following Citus for a while, uh, specifically for this use case. Um, concurrency and analytics are, have kind of been at odds with each other from what I've seen, uh, and this looks like a great solution. The other thing I'll mention is we have people that use us for embedding. So they embed Chartio's dashboards into their own product. Maybe they run a web app and they create an analytics portal. Uh, in their product and they don't want to build out their own charting library or they don't want to start from scratch with something like D3. So they'll embed Chartio instead. Uh, and that's another use case that generates a lot of load. Uh, so something that can handle concurrency for, for dashboarding is very important. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, uh, AJ and Marco, for today's webinar. And uh, once again, everyone, we uh, did record today's webinar. We'll uh, send a link to the recording uh, in a little while as well as uh, uh, access to the uh, presentation slides. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to AJ or Marco or uh, either one of our companies. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.